My name is Alan Noren. I'm the chairman of the executive committee of the faculty of the College of Medicine. Uh, it's my pleasure today to represent the committee and uh, present um, to you uh, Carlos Peto, who's our, our new dean. Uh, he'll be talking about the building a future for Downstate's uh, uh, future. And um, by way of introduction, um, I'd like to give you some background. Uh, the dean graduated from Brown University um, in 1979. Uh, he may not want me to mention that, the, the year, but uh, <laughs> it's in his, <laughs> in his documents. Um, he, um, uh, he attended the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, where he was awarded MD degree in 1983. He then did um, his residency in psychiatry um, at Mass General Harvard Medical School. Uh, finishing in 1986. Um, he then um, went to the National Institutes of Mental Health uh, where he was a research psychiatrist and chief of genetics research program and acting chief of pharmacologic and somatic treatments program in the uh, schizophrenia research branch. Uh, he then went back to academia in 1990 uh, to one of our sister institutions where he was assistant professor of psychiatry um, at Stony Brook from 90 to 92. Um, he then moved to Brown University where he was an assistant professor of psychiatry from 1992 to 1996. Um, he then moved back to uh, the SUNY system where he was associate professor of psychiatry and director of genetics research um, at SUNY Buffalo. Uh, in um, 2001, he became professor of psychiatry uh, at Upstate uh, Medical Center at SUNY Upstate, uh, where he was also director for the Center of uh, Psychiatric and Molecular Genetics. And then in, uh, he decided uh, to warm up and move to California, uh, where he was the France Alexander Professor of Psychiatry and Chair at um, uh, University of Southern California. Dr. Pato's, uh, Pato's uh, research has focused on genomic psychiatry with emphasis on population-based genetic studies uh, in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And let us all welcome him to the podium. So, Okay, if we could turn these off. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to, as sort of the first town hall, begin a, a discussion, a conversation. And uh, you'll find me talking about building a vision because I think it's something that we need to do together. It's not something that uh, can be top down. Uh, it has to be very participatory. And I think importantly, it needs to start with getting an understanding of who we are. And obviously being among the newest of the members of we, uh, I would like to give you a sense of sort of who we are from a historical perspective. I also want to create or help develop an understanding of what we do, who we serve, what type of contribution we make and I mean locally as well as globally, and what is the potential impact that we can have. And I think in terms of developing this, that I want to think in terms of three um, legs of a stool, uh, three foundations, learning, care, and discovery. So let's go back to who are we? What are the types of contributions, the types of impact that Downstate has had historically and represents what's in our genes? All right, first of all, we're one of the oldest medical schools in the United States. We look at people, and it's through people that you begin to understand who we are. Austin Flint championed the use of the stethoscope in the United States in the 60s. Frank Hamilton, who was one of the first advocates for skin grafting and a leading authority in, figure, in fractures, again in the 60s. John Dalton, first 
to use the concept of teaching physiology by conducting experiments in animals. George Sternberger, pioneering immunologist, discovering typhoid fever and the bacillus. Robert Dickinson, the first modern pamphlet on voluntary birth control in 1931. Alfred Adler, coining the phrase inferiority complex, something that I suspect we want to work with. Because regardless of how challenged we may feel at times, one of the last things I see here is any reason to focus on a sense of inferiority. And, and I will tell you, one of the things that strikes me about, I'm going to digress, about Downstate, something that Alan didn't mention about me, is that before I went to Brown, I uh, lived in Staten Island. I was born in Portugal, but brought up in the United States. And I was a Stuyvesant graduate. And Stuyvesant back in 70 through 74 was an absolute pit. <laughs> it was a horrible facility with the most brilliant people. And it was a tradition. My uncle, who had been brought up in the United States also, uh, were a very bicontinental family, had gone to Stuyvesant. My brother went to Stuyvesant. There's a family tradition. There's a history of things progressing. And at that time, that was the first year with female students at Stuyvesant. And you go through a number of these transitions. and. I think we need to really see what is done in New York City for the excellence it represents in so many ways. To continue, we also have Samuel Kuntz in 70, right around the same period, first African-American transplant surgeon. Eli Friedman, who not only is sitting on the second row, but had the first federally funded dialysis program in 64, and invented the portable dialysis machine. Raymond Demadian, when I look at the state of our imaging technology to realize that MRIs were first invented here and used on humans here, um, is simultaneously surprising and encouraging because what we can achieve is beyond what people assume. And one of the stories that I learned in the last four months was that when Ray tried to get the resources to actually build the very first MRI, he took years of pushing paper for approvals and so on. And apparently, and I don't know the truth of this, but many people have told me it is true, he apparently came in one weekend with a jackhammer and jackhammered a hole between one floor and the other to create the space necessary to build the prototype. We're not encouraging this lack <laughs> of respect for um, structure, um, but sometimes I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Henry Bagleiter published one of the hallmark landmark studies showing that children of alcoholics appear to carry a genetic risk. And I think when you look at what Downstate has contributed in these fields, the coordinating role in terms of COGA, um, and other major nationwide population studies, it is just incredible to recognize the contributions that are made. Um, the work on HIV infection in women, looking at transmission between mother and fetus in 86 by Sheldon Landsman. Of course, Robert Furtgott, winning the Nobel Prize in 1998. Remember, I believe that history is really about understanding who we are, understanding what we're capable of, and understanding that the challenges that seem daunting today, in fact, probably existed throughout. And so let, let's try to build on that. And, I, and I'm going to see if I can do this relatively quickly, because what I'd love to do, and it may be somewhat of a delusion of mine, is actually open this up to questions and interactions and thoughts from the audience. But if we think of care, it's important to recognize that more New York City doctors graduated from Downstate than any other medical school. In terms of learning, and this was interesting, we rank eighth in terms of graduates that are in academic positions on faculties in medical schools. 
That was not something I particularly expected. Um, and clearly there are other medical schools our age and with significant classes. Very critically, we are defined by the people that we serve. And who are they? They're a very diverse community. In fact, community is really communities in the plural. In my drive from Bay Ridge to here, I cross one neighborhood versus another versus another. But it isn't versus, it's, it conf it's confluent. It just seems to melt one into the other. But what is shared in much of our population is a very high concentration of vulnerable people. They are suffering from disparities in access to care, in, in the means that they bring to be able to address it, in health outcomes. And I would like to add one that isn't commonly thrown out, in access and participation in discovery, in research. That particular disparity is something that we as an academic center in this community need to address as much as the ones that relate to each individual's health care. Because in not understanding what our population needs, we fail in so many ways. So let's talk about learning. Again, we're going to use very parallel structure in the sense that what do we mean by learning? I think it's in a very broad context. Again, who do we serve? Who are our students? And our students are the physicians that treat our community, obviously our medical students, obviously our residents, our patients, their families. It's a very broad construct. But if we think more narrowly, who is our student body? Well, we have a tremendously diverse student body, but a third of them are from Brooklyn, half are from New York City, 90% are from New York State, and we are 25% minority, not that I fully understand what that term means nowadays, 31% Asian, 44% white, I don't see any majority, quite honestly, but we also are 96 percentile in terms of schools with African American graduates and 74th percentile with Hispanic graduates. This is entirely consistent with the community that we serve. And that achievement is something that we should feel tremendously proud of. We've also led the way in some ways in looking at how we create the learning environment, how we deal with different tiles, types and styles of learners. And uh, you know, I had the privilege of stepping in to the dean's role with Dr. Pamela Sass as the uh, interim dean who led the transformation of this curriculum. I've been delighted working with her and I, one of the things that I've commented on is that the other place that has looked at integrated pathways and so on, Harvard, tends to publish a lot about what they're doing. We just tend to do it extremely well and forget to mention it to anyone. This is an extraordinary set of developments that really looks at an integration of the experience of becoming a clinician with the acquisition of knowledge. And in many ways reflects where we are because from a point of view of learning, if we think about those of us from the last millennium who learned in an environment where key to becoming a physician was having knowledge, content, data available at our fingertips when we're in a crisis trying to deal with a patient. That issue, which by the way, I hated as a medical student, it was really just unfortunate and, and mind numbing. That issue is no longer that relevant because we all carry our iPhones with that data at our fingertips. What we need to do is understand what the data is. Is it valid? Is it applicable? And we need to understand how to think. And so here you're seeing a transition where the pure basic science content focus is now being integrated to the clinical thinking, the clinical critical aspects of treating patients. And you're seeing an increasing move to that clinical experience because it's now the management and understanding of the implementation and application of that data that is so critical. What's fascinating is that despite all the challenges that we all know Downstate has been facing, we have just finished an accreditation visit that went 
beautifully. And obviously, I am delighted to get to take credit for something I had nothing to do with. This was brilliantly done. And not only are we fully accredited, but the official step one results from the students who have now gone through the first two years were extraordinary. They're really exceptional and they're well, they exceed the national average despite all the challenges that we've been facing. Let's talk about our residency programs. We have a huge residency set and fellowships with 888 residents and most of the programs are doing extremely well. In a, in a program like this, it will always be in churn. There will always be crisis. There will always be a program that does not meet um, expectations. And the bottom line is, when they do, we should change our expectations and make them better. I don't believe in best practices. I believe in the best practices we know today and how do we start becoming better. Here, what we have is not only the tremendous challenges, but the tremendous opportunity based on the population and what our residents see. But we're also in a new social environment where learners see themselves, and I don't know if I see that as appropriate, but they do as consumers. And as such, they're here to defend their education, even before they understand what their education needs really are. The experience is wonderful, but quite honestly, I'm not diminishing the fact that that balance between service and education is critical. And it's something that we all only have one perspective on. We need to understand from every sense when that balance is going out of whack. And it can go in any direction. And one of the things that fascinated me was when over a 10 year period as a chair with 70 some odd residents and fellows in my department, I saw that the single complaint that the service versus education balance was never appropriate continue at almost exactly the same percentage, but change entirely in nature. When I started, it was about the residents had too much service, and that was compromising their education. By the end, it was that the attendings had too much service and weren't available to teach. And yet, the percent of anxiety over that was almost identical, yet represented two very different things. Um, what I've seen when we're looking at those programs that are facing challenges is a tremendous commitment of our academic health system to make sure that the graduate medical education program succeeds. And this, of course, leads to successful match, to people wanting to be here, and wanting, hopefully, to ultimately serve our community. So let's address care. Again, I'm looking at those three legs of a stool. In terms of care, we all understand this question comes up again. Who are we? What is the academic health system that we are part of, that we are the college for? The answer that is most obvious is the University Hospital of Brooklyn. It is SUNY owned, a tertiary regional referral center, clearly serves our community, 376 beds with a variety of specialty areas. But it's not just a referral center. It has an ER. It serves the community at every level and does it across the street from yet another partner that we may not as often see as part of us, as we. And in fact, as I've learned the history, it's gone from constructing this campus to be directly across the street in the hopes of tremendous integration to eras of tremendous division, to opportunities to rebuild that integration. Kings County is H HC owned, so New York City owned. What we share here is a public institution and they serve our community, the exact same community. And in that sense, that struck me. There, there's nearly no difference between the patients that come to one versus the other. And I think the sooner that we build that into our understanding of how to have a vision 
the better we're going to be because we'll start to really look at where the two institutions, the potential virtual single campus, do differentiate and where they maybe should differentiate. Obviously, the level one trauma center. They both have a variety of specialty areas. It is hard to not see Kings County as our primary affiliate. And I would argue, potentially, and I'm early in this process, and this is something that we need to do together, but even considering it an affiliate versus part of the central academic medical center slash system may not be appropriate. Um, they are the leading and our partner in developing our, the new district program. These are built in terms of how we apply the Affordable Care Act and a variety of changes to the delivery of care. Care that will probably be formed under a different model where value really underscores the issues of both quality and the issues of cost. And quality is probably among the hardest of the ones to measure and to achieve. And while I was at AAMC the last weekend, Daryl Kirch did a presentation. He's the president and CEO of AAMC. And he made, I'm going to quote from that presentation, one of the biggest challenges we have in this transforming health system is how we approach disparities, how we approach the vulnerability of the population we serve. And the quote was that there is no quality in the face of inequality. And I think fundamentally, this is a message that needs to be centrally incorporated. We are Kings County's College of Medicine. And we are one faculty. Whether we behave that way seems a question. Um, I'm looking at Stan Fisher and recognizing that when we talk about one faculty, we have the University Physicians of Brooklyn, our practice plan as yet another component, and understanding how that entity will play a role in creating a new vision is also critical. For those who don't know, I've also in the middle of all these moves, mainly through SUNY campuses, been very involved with the VA, and I think the VA is a central example of excellence and challenge. Um, this is a system that was winding down because wars were a thing of the past, and unfortunately they weren't, and now are in no way able to meet the demand, but in many ways doing things that are pioneering in terms of excellence of integration and looking at the control and appropriate involvement of a variety of uh, approaches to deal with each challenge. Here, we are, they have two major affiliates. The New York Harbor uh, portion of Vision 3 has NYU and has Downstate. And originally, that would have been an affiliation primarily with Brooklyn for Downstate and primarily with Manhattan. I think we have tremendous opportunities to examine and build on that relationship. They are in the need to partner in a great many ways. And I think we have a potential of addressing the federally owned public partner in a very different way than we have. And uh, again, another potential element in terms of building a vision. We also serve our community through a number of other affiliates. And one of the questions, and again, I'm trying to highlight questions, is to what degree should we focus on what's clear, our primary public systems, versus our affiliations with private delivery systems that deliver care in our community as well. As we know, many of the somewhat so-called private institutions are part of the safety net for this community, and in fact, differ from us in very minimal ways. In some cases, receive vastly more financial support from the state than we do, so are they really private or not? Um, avoiding that political question, um, our patients and their families are our community. To reemphasize something that we started with, unfortunately, there is a poor access to care. We understand the socioeconomic challenges that many in our community suffer. 
And with it comes a tremendous clarity that our community has demonstrably poor health outcomes compared to many. And this is something that we should feel inherently committed to having an impact on. And the other highlight here is with a tremendous amount of comorbidity. When I was asked, as I was interviewing for this role, what would you want our students to learn? What do you want them to know when they leave and become residents? My answer was that they're here to treat people. That they are not here to treat the fracture on curtain six or the gallbladder. They are here to treat people in the context of their families and that when you do that you realize that the comorbidity is in that person and if you can treat the person they will tell you what they're suffering with, they will help you understand, they'll help you define what to do and they will partner with you. That distancing that we all do and in the ER are dealing with the crisis of whatever that particular crisis is at the moment is still important but never if it's not in the context of the individual, in the context of the community. And again, I want to accentuate that last point. Uh, people know that obviously I've been very involved in research, but I believe that this exact same population has not been actively recruited for research. We fail to understand what we need to do for these patients. And because of that, we try to apply what's been learned from a highly Euro-Caucasian focused research paradigm to populations where that's just not equally valid. And so it is critical for us to partner with our patients to try to understand what we need to know to be able to serve them best. So that brings us to the last leg of the stool, discovery. And I prefer to think research comes with so many different uh, stigmas. So much of what we deal with deals with stigma. But especially in our communities, the sense that they have in the past been subjected to inappropriate research, to being treated as if we weren't thinking of them as individuals first needs to be acknowledged, but now to remain overly resistant to research is actually part of what's leading to the poor health outcomes that people are experiencing. And so it is one of the elements. And I think people have asked me since I got here what the role for discovery, for research is for Downstate. As you know, we have two large departments of basic science. We have a number of laboratories. We're actually blessed with an extraordinary amount of space compared to the number of investigators we have. Usable space is greatly attenuated, but I think we can see that that in initial resource is, is very important. We also have tremendous amount of talent, but we need to build, and we need to build a vision of where to go with this. And I think in looking at what we do today, not just what we've done in the past, but what we do today and what we can do in the future, we need to remind ourselves of the programs that have been tremendous contributions to the field. We have COGA looking at alcoholism, the genetics of alcoholism. Weiss focused on a tremendously successful and important study of women with AIDS and a number of disparity centers at this point focused on the very issues that are our challenge in terms of providing for a good health outcome. We're looking at a couple of new initiatives, President Williams' initiative for disparities, where he has committed significant dollars to creating pilot studies that bring the talent we have together in ways that hopefully will focus on disparities. And we're building a new institute for genomic health. And one of the underscoring principles in this is that 
we far too often focus on what the genomic genetic risks for illness are. What are those things that are leading people to become susceptible and vulnerable to illness? Forgetting that that exact same genomic profile is providing a tremendous amount of strength for resilience, for the ability to resist particular illnesses, and we need to study it from both aspects. So it is really underscoring the importance of focusing on health, but again, highlighting a need to try to do this in an integrated way. We've now brought a new set of studies of over $11 million from NIH that focus on our community members of African ancestry. And why? Because too small a number of pati patients and their families have participated in the studies for us to understand an incredibly important part of the story and ways that we can address the very population that we serve. I think there's a couple of other things that are not unique to downstate. One is that we're in an era of team science. The, what the individual can achieve is amplified by the synergies of working in a team. But there's also a critical need for us, I believe, to focus on our population, on our community, and to target the disparities, and to really define, and I don't have the answer yet, but define the role for downstate in the different translational stages, which really means from basic research throughout the paradigm of development of treatments to our patients and their families where in their lives, where they live and how they live. I think that where we see success over the last 10, 15 years has been in programs focused on the community, but I think more than that, there's a tremendous opportunity to play a leading role in looking at our diverse populations. So, in conclusion, and I told you I wanted to leave some time for questions, so the burden's now going to fall on what is really a fairly sizable audience, including a number of people standing in the back. Um, this is the beginning of a, a, a conversation, a discussion, a process that everyone needs to feel comfortable contributing to, and I think feel a, an obligation, not just a right, to contribute to as we define how we move forward. And I welcome any questions, um, and I'll certainly be willing to throw out my initial thoughts on things, uh, but I doubt I have any answers that are in any way complete at this point in time. Again, I'm delighted to be here and very excited about the future of Downstate and what we can do together. Thank you.